I've been foraging for mushrooms since I was a child and I truly enjoy this activity and I'm captivated by the bountiful treasures and interesting discoveries I've encountered. I forage for myself as well as many local restaurants. They may not know my name and call me the mushroom lady, but they sure gather around with interest to see what I've brought them. I prepared this same preparation a while ago for a couple of other clubs and I'm not an experienced speaker, so I'll just read from my notes and present my PowerPoint creation for you. I'll try to go through it quickly. I know you've had a long night, so hopefully there'll be some times for questions at the end. I was asked to talk to you about foraging and identification of wild mushrooms and other wild edible foods. From my years of experience, I can tell you that it's not an easy task to identify every mushroom you come across. There are many, so many species and many that closely resemble one another that it can become confusing trying to identify them as well as remembering their name. It's best to learn to recognize some of the more identifiable edible species really well first. With the help of a number of good textbooks, or guidance from experienced foragers, you can get started. Joining a mycology club such as the Toronto Mycology Club is an excellent way to learn. You receive the Mycelium newsletter and have access to their website where members can post mushroom pictures and get help with identification. They have regular speakers at their meetings and the speakers presentations are recorded and the video is posted on the website for those members unable to attend. There are organized forays during the spring and fall months on both Saturdays and Sundays and occasionally on a Wednesday. On these forays all of the specimens collected are identified and there are many experts present. The club has a lot of books available to loan out from their library and they also offer identification courses. In addition, there are a number of enjoyable social gatherings for special mushroom dinners at restaurants and outdoor picnics after forums. You have the opportunity to develop new friendships and plan special foraging trips together. For those that are interested in learning more, I have photocopied a handout of recommended books on the table there. There's a few copies and your club will um, is going to photocopy for the newsletter I think too. There's also um, a recipe, a mushroom recipe, and a list of rules to follow for eating wild mushrooms safely. I use the hen of the woods in the recipe instead of chicken of the woods. You can substitute various other mushrooms as well for this recipe. There are also business cards available at the back on the table with the Toronto Mycology Club website information for those who may be interested in joining. I was fortunate to grow up in Thunder Bay and have the experience of learning to identify and forage for a variety of mushrooms at an early age. Being the eldest, I accompanied my dad on his fishing and foraging adventures, so I came into this rather addictive interest innocently. My dad had a lot of knowledge and experience from foraging since he grew up in Europe, where harvesting wild mushrooms was a regular pastime. As a young child, I was quite happy and excited to go on these outings. My dad had his secret spots where edible king foliage grew. Many of his Polish friends tried to discover where he found them, but of course, he would not reveal anything. I felt privileged to be the only other person to know his secret spots for bullies and chanterelles. I had many vivid dreams of finding these never-ending rows of bullies and chanterelles. And no, I was not eating any funny mushrooms. I le learned how to clean the mushrooms and about preparing them in jars. The most common mushroom we preserved was the honey mushroom, since it was always so plentiful. It was traditional for our family to have honey mushrooms in a cream sauce on family and holiday celebrations. I continue that tradition with my own family, 
but I still can't convince a few of them to like my books. I have enjoyed sharing my knowledge and taking my children foraging, and now I have also been taking my granddaughter foraging for a number of years. She has learned to recognize a number of edibles. Despite the fact she doesn't like eating them, she's always eager to learn to earn a bit of money helping me. The experience I shared with my dad, mushroom picking, are the most treasured memories I have of my youth. For me, it's an exhilarating treasure hunt and an adventure to hike through the woods foraging. You sometimes come up empty exploring new sites, but there is always the benefit of fresh air, sunshine, and exercise. I was never afraid of being alone in the woods since it was such a thrill to find those mushrooms. I used to have a faithful dog I took along for company and protection, but now I rely on friends to accompany me or coaxing my husband into sharing this activity. Unfortunately, taking him along has backfired because when I reveal my secret spots to him, he's always walking double time to get there first. And then he wanders all away quietly to his secret spots and disappears. <laughs> it's not even it's not even any use whistling for him because he won't wear his hearing aids. He used to like duck hunting and fishing, but I think fungi fever has taken over. Oh dear, I think I need another faithful dog. For the past 20 years, I have been a member of the Toronto Mycology Club and have had led a number of forays for the club. Forays have been conducted on rare property in conjunction with our club and their members, as well as forays on Langdon Hall property with the purpose of helping the chefs with identification. My husband and I have also enjoyed traveling on adventure trips with various club members. We traveled to Kelowna to pick morels after a big forest fire, as well as to Vancouver Island to forage for the plentiful chanterelles and search for matsutake. It's great to develop a few good mushroom companions to share your interest with and also to share good locations with. Every season can be different and you may find a lot of varieties in a spot you found nothing for a few years. The amount of sun and rain and temperatures will influence what grows. To be successful, you have to be persistent in checking the same locations over different times of the year and continue doing so every year. Over the years, I have foraged many varieties and have accumulated abundant foods. I have enough dried, frozen, and canned varieties for myself. I have also been growing some of my own shiitake mushrooms on the box. Since the chefs at Langdon were quite interested in forage mushrooms, they were eager for me to share my bounty with them. By request, I also began to forage some wild edible plants, such as watercress, sorrel, nettles, fiddleheads, sumac, wild leeks, seeds from Queen Anne's lace and lamb's quarters, and various berries and flowers. I have helped friends to sell some of their excess backyard produce, such as garlic scapes, turnips, icicle radishes, and exotic fruits such as pawpaws and Despite the time and effort required, there have been some nice fringe benefits besides earning some extra retirement money. My husband and I have enjoyed a few invitations to fall forage dinner events, and I've got to sample some interesting preserves and other creations from the kitchen. A real highlight was being asked to take the head chef at Langdon Hall out foraging for a TV series called The Chef's Domain. It was late in the season, but luckily we did find a couple of mushrooms, as well as a golf ball. You can always depend on finding golf balls out in the middle of nowhere. You never know what unusual surprises you might find out there. <laughs> okay, 
Occasionally, you'll be fortunate to find a rare fungal species or an oddball fungal anomaly. The one mushroom growing on another one. You might come across rare spring ephemerals, such as the harbinger of spring, or other beautiful and unusual plants and wildlife. Sometimes your foraging buddies even set up practical jokes for you. I have entered retirement into an even busier but more enjoyable pastime. I hope to continue this for as long as I'm able and the mushrooms are still there to be found in my favorite spots. So if you see me around carrying buckets or baskets with rubber boots or hiking shoes on and wearing a pink visor, you'll know what I'm up to. One gentleman who saw me coming out of the woods carrying mushrooms called me the gypsy lady. Another one thought I was a deer coming out of the mud, out of the woods. Well, anyway, as the deer gypsy mushroom lady, I'm always ready to share my knowledge and enthusiasm for the love of mushrooms and foraging. I'll talk a little bit about uh, mushroom identification. Mushroom identification is a very detailed process. Some mushrooms are very easily identified because they are unique and not easily confused with similar species. Learning to recognize these to begin foraging will be very rewarding. Here are some easily identified good edibles. Chanterelles, these are the common chanterelle siberius. There's also different types of chanterelles. They look different out west, um, many different species. There's a white one and uh, ones that don't look like the ones we find out here. There's also uh, winter yellowfoot chanterelles that grow this time of year. They're much smaller. Morels. There's uh, different type, oh, three different types of morels, so probably a lot more species as well. But the main ones are your, your black morels, which are the early ones. They grow in different locations on slopes where it's shadier and very fertile soils. And then there's the yellow morels, which come out couple of weeks later and they're usually more out in the open. You can find them around dead apple trees, dying elm trees, lots of lots of locations that may surprise you just by the edges of walkways too. And then there's your giant morels, which are the last ones at the end of the season. Chicken of the woods. Puffballs, giant puffballs, and then your small gem studded, and perla perlatum, and uh, piriforme. Uh, lobster mushrooms, which are actually um, a like a mold or something growing on usually a rustulus or lactarius, and it changes the mushroom into this hard mushroom, the uh, Hypomyces lactiflorum. It, which grows on these species to change it into what's called a lobster mushroom. Uh, these are tooth fungi, hericium, bear's head, or coxcomb, lion's mane. They're all in the same family, different types of hericiums. Um, tooth fungi, these are hedgehog mushrooms, hiddenums. There's a couple of different varieties, tiny ones and much larger ones that are paler in color. This is a hen of the woods, Rifola, Brandosa, black trumpet mushrooms that grow, they have a, quite a lengthy growth period. We just picked some more a couple of days ago and we started picking them through the end of uh, August. Um, parasol mushrooms, somebody brought in a sample, was wondering what it was. This is the um, type of mushroom that she brought in, a lepiota. Could be a procera that she brought in, which is edible. Milk cap mushrooms, the ones that have the orange latex milk are usually the good ones. To continue foraging, to continue learning about many of the other mushroom species you will likely encounter, it will be good for you to obtain a few good identification books. Joining a mushroom club will aid you in gaining knowledge and experience as well. 
Mushroom identification can be very technical with a lot of scientific terms. Many textbooks will have a word glossary to help explain the meaning of identification terms. Most identification charts included in field guides will require the knowledge of the color of the spore print just to begin your identif identification process. And there's uh, some samples of spore prints at the back if you'd like to see what they look like. Putting the cap of the mushroom with the gills or pores facing downwards on a piece of paper will give you a spore print. To see what color the spores are, you should use two sheets of paper, one being white and another one black. There are many other features of the mushroom that you will have to observe to help with identification. Here are some of the identifying features you will have to observe. The spore print, of course, the cap, the flesh, the odor, taste, the gills, margin of the cap, the stalk, the habitat and season, as well as the presence of veils or cobwebs under the gills and the pres and or the presence of a universal veil and its edibility as well. Okay, so here are some features you can see. Where's that little clicker here? Okay, I'll just come around here. Uh, you can see a staining reaction here, and this mushroom has pores, not gills, very smooth cap, shape of the stalk is bulbous at the base, and it's kind of a fibrose, uh, fibrose texture here. This mushroom has teeth instead of gills or pores. This is an agaricus, and they typically they start off with pink gills. And then they turn this chocolate color. This is like the mushrooms you buy in the store. You can see here that the gills are not attached to the stem. That's another feature. Some mushrooms have the gills attached. Some have the gills running down the stem. These are all features that help you identify. Here's uh, another bolete. It has pores. This one has very, the color of the pores and also it stains blue. This one is not edible. Anything any bolete that has reddish or dark orange pores is usually non-edible. Here's another bolete. You see the color of the flesh there, instead of white, it's yellow. A very rough stem here. And this is another um, parasol mushroom, Lepioda racodes. It's a scaly cap, very scaly cap here. It has um, a partial veil here. You can see on the stem, shape of the very long stalk bulbous base. So these are all different features that help you identify mushrooms. I'll talk a little bit about the fifth kingdom. Oh here is yeah here is another slide it shows you the season that it grows. This is one mushroom that grows very late. It can withstand ice and snow grows on trees, Flamulina valutipes, and those little white enoki mushrooms are exactly the same mushroom they sell in stores, except they grow them in jars in the dark, so they turn out completely white, but it's the same mushroom. Here's a milk mushroom, uh, Lactarius. It will exude blue milk. This is another milk mushroom. You can see this identifying feature, the milk, they're called milk caps, like all the Lactarius. And here's another uh, agaricus. You can see the gills start off pinkish and they will eventually turn a chocolatey color. And again, it's got a partial veil. So now we'll talk a little bit about the fifth kingdom. Share a bit uh, more information about the mysterious hidden kingdom of fungi and a bit about their importance and use. What is the largest organism in the world? People often think of the blue whale or aspen trees that grow in clones of thousands of trees attached to a spreading root system. The honey mushroom, Armillaria, also grows clonally and is now known to be the world's largest organism. It is known to be one of the most aggressive, invasive, destructive mushrooms we have, attacking trees, shrubs, and even gardens. 
causing a deadly root rot and moving from plant to plant. The mycelium of the giant armillaria ostoye honey mushroom in the Blue Mountains of Oregon is called the humongous fungus. It covers an area of close to 10 square kilometers, and it, it is estimated to be between two and 8,000 years old. Fungi are everywhere, in our fields, forests, soil, in our buildings, and our own yards. I'm sure many of you have seen some of these unusual garden buddies popping up in your garden beds and mulched areas under and on trees or around stumps and shrubs in your lawn or even popping up in one of your planters. If you're lucky, you may even have some good edible mushrooms show up every year in the same spot. You might be wondering what kind of mushroom they are or why they're there or if they might be harmful to your pets or young children. Mushroom produce, mushrooms produce thousands of spores which are aided in their distribution by the wind and under suitable growing conditions they may germinate. More likely the spores are already there in the mulch, soil or wood products you've brought into your yard. If you are concerned about them being harmful you may be able to get help with identification if you take some good pictures and upload them on your computer to sites such as mushroomexpert.com. If you want to use mushrooms for culinary purposes, you need to have 100% positive identification by determining their scientific name from observations of characteristics you have learned in great detail. It's a good idea to get confirming support from an experienced individual before you attempt to eat them and never eat any wild edible mushrooms raw. Once your curiosity is aroused, you may want to venture beyond the backyard into the woods to look for morels, chanterelles, porcini, or other choice edibles. The satisfaction of finding good edibles is very hard to resist, and you may be faced with an abundance of mushrooms don't eat too many at one time or consume too much alcohol with them. And make sure the ones you cook are not past their prime. Clean dirt and debris from the mushrooms and cut into pieces, examining for bugs and small grubs in the gills and flesh. You don't have to wash them as this will make them soggy. You can use a damp mushroom brush or scrape with a small knife to help clean them. Put them, pack them dry with paper towels if you need to wash some of them. You may want to wear latex or kitchen gloves since some mushrooms stain your hands. After the cleaning and cutting, you can get the skillets going and cook them up in butter or olive oil. If you have a surplus that, that won't all be eaten soon, you can freeze the cooked mushrooms after they have cooled. You can also dry the surplus mush surplus instead of cooking them. Drying can also take hours of work and the odor will fill the house. The mushrooms will again have to be cleaned and trimmed and then sliced into thinner sections for drying. Use of store-bought dehydrators is ideal because it takes less time. You can control the temperature and check on them easily to make sure they are thoroughly dried. Alternately, you can dry them outdoors, in the sun, on wire screens, or use cheesecloth, or hang them in your kitchen to dry strung with a needle on cotton strings. You can also dry them on trays in a warm stove on low temperature. Store dried mushrooms in airtight containers in a dry, dark, and cool location. Dried mushrooms can be put into soups and stews, but for other dishes, you should reconstitute them in lukewarm water for 20 minutes. Don't use boiling water as it will impair the flavor. You can use the leftover water afterwards for stock or to make gravy. Make sure the liquid, you pour the liquid through a sieve first to remove any loosened debris. Preserving your surplus by pickling them in jars is also an option. There are various recipes available using oil and vinegar, and adding certain spices such as peppercorns, garlic cloves, and bay leaves. You can boil them in salty water and pickle them in sterilized jars using this briny water. For pickling, the mushrooms should be cleaned well 
and then blanch before pickling. Sterilize everything you use in boiling water. Make sure the containers used have a good seal and when filled that they are sealed tightly. Salt layering is also an option and is an old method. Make sure the mushrooms are clean and fresh. Use one part salt to three parts mushrooms and layer them alternately with the final layer covered completely with salt. Use containers that will not corrode. Sterilized jars are best, but you can use plastic containers. Many people are fearful of eating mushrooms, wild mushrooms, while many love to eat them. This characteristic seems to be culturally determined. Most people from Central and Eastern European background are accustomed to mushroom picking as a pastime, while those of Anglo-Saxon origin are fearful. There are over 10,000 species of fleshy fungi, and most of them are perfectly harmless. A small number are hunted for their delicious flavor, and a few have even been domesticated and commercialized. Another few are deadly poisonous, and many others can cause various serious physical discomforts. The most poisonous mushroom in eastern North America is probably Amanita varosa, the destroying angel, which is pure white and has both an annular ring and a vulva. In the west, you have Amanita phylloides, the death cap which is often greenish, has a greenish cap and also an annular ring and vulva. 50% of all serious mushroom poisonings and 95% of fatalities are caused by members of the Amanita, which contain either amatoxins or phallotoxins. Another deadly poisonous mushroom, a common mushroom containing amatoxins, is Gallerina autumnalis. Mushroom poisonings are divided into eight groups, depending on the toxin present. Group one is aminitin poisoning. Group two is monomethyl hydrogen poisoning. Morels are one of the finest edible fungi fruiting in the spring, but also fruiting at the same time as the false morel, Gyromitra esculenta. To the inexperienced forager, the false morel looks similar to the morel. The toxin precursor precursor is called gyromitrin, which when eaten and thus hydrolyzed to MMH, monomethylhydrazine, becomes a toxin. MMH, which is used as a rocket fuel, is extremely toxic. Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about the importance of fungi. Fungi are important in many ways. We need and love nature because it inspires us to be creative. Fungi are beautiful and fascinating and inspire artists to paint, sculpt, photograph, and study them. Here are some of the examples of mushroom artistry. Mushrooms can be so bizarre and alien looking, you'd almost think they came from another planet. Our knowledge on the use of the use of mushrooms goes back in China more than 12,000 years, but written records only go back 2,000 years. The Romans loved wild mushrooms and wrote about how they used them in feasts as well as occasions on which reputed poisonings of emperors were caused. The discovery of the 5,000 year old ice man, Utzi, found preserved in ice at the Italian and Austrian border with a pouch on his possession containing two mushrooms, shows that use and knowledge of mushrooms goes back to prehistoric times. Mushrooms, whether wild or cultivated, contain medicinally beneficial polysaccharides, in addition to amino acid complexes that are high in lysine, which is an essential amino acid that is absent in food staples such as rice, wheat, corn, and barley. In addition, mushrooms are rich in vitamins and minerals and low in fat and calories.
Mushrooms are an important food source and part of the local economy in many societies, and some are eaten for their psychoactive properties and have been used around the world in religious ceremonies for thousands of years. Some edible fungi are grown commercially in large quantities, and more than 100 kinds are now being cultivated. Wild mushrooms are picked and eaten around the world and sold in markets and on roadsides. More than a thousand kinds of mushrooms are sold as edible around the world. More than 400 types of mushrooms are medicinal and being used in almost every <coughs> Harvesting of wild edible mushrooms is a big business that is gaining popularity. It's called the modern day gold rush. People are coming to harvest wild mushrooms in Western Canada and the U.S. and to the Northwest Territories from all over the world. Mushroom hunting is a taste of the hunter-gatherer lifestyle and satisfies a primal instinct. This allure of hunting for wild mushrooms has endured since the complex world of fungi is certainly very enthralling. Despite the risks, foraging for fungi has become a popular pastime in many countries. In France, Italy, Poland, and Russia, foraging is almost a national obsession. Some of the fungi, such as the rare and sought after matsutake, are a real prize and command high prices. Fungi have been praised for their medicinal qualities for many centuries. Asian medicine uses a number of fungal species to cure wide ranges of diseases. Western medicine is more skeptical, but much research is being done in this field. Fungi have been used in the production of antibiotics. The original discovery of penicillin produced by a fungal species of penicillium dates back to 1928. Fungi serve as sources for the production of enzymes and other valuable chemical compounds that are used in medicines and as food additives. Use of fungal enzymes for washing in cold water may save on energy usage. Also, using organic waste products for biofuel is based on fungal enzymes. Fungi have been used to help clean up oil spills. It is now recognized that many fungi possess antibacterial and antiviral compounds. There is much interest in the scientific community in researching the potential of fungi in areas such as cleaning up pollution and radiation and their immune boosting properties. With continued research, some new fungus might contain an enzyme that could produce an agent against cancer or produce new antibiotics. Mushrooms are important in our ecosystem as decomposers. Most of them break down organic matter into nutrients that are usable to other organisms. They can break down tough plant material like cellulose and lignin found in wood. Those, these decomposers are called saprotrophs. Besides these saprotrophs, many mushrooms are ectomycorrhizal, where the spreading hyphal network of the fungi will form a symbiotic relationship with the fine root tips of specific types of trees to trade water and nutrients for the sugars produced by photosynthesis in the tree leaves. This extended root system provided by the fungi helps to connect different plant species and other fungi into a complex underground network, the wood wide web. The exchange of nutrients across species boundaries results in stable ecosystem with high biodiversity. Without fungi, many plants would suffer from malnutrition. Some mushroom, some mushroom forming fungi are predatory or pathogenic. They grow on top of other mushrooms. They can infect like a virus and cause disease or can trap or even paralyze insects with toxins. These are cordyceps species. The fascinating inhabitants of the fungal kingdom are a mystery living a hidden life, appearing and disappearing in strange and unpredictable ways. The occurrence of many fungal fruiting bodies is short and sporadic, and thus a rather small amount of research has been conducted so far in mycology as compared to zoology and botany. Present knowledge of fungal diversity is incomplete, 
and only 10,000 species are described. It is estimated that 1.5 to 5 million fungal species exist on Earth. So that leaves 93% still to be discovered. And that's it. Thank you very much.